The Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. Phil Gaiman needed to reclaim his love for his sport. He was a professional cyclist, and in recent years, much of his time had been spent in studying the science of endurance, uh, focusing on it like a job. And he lost the love for which he first entered the sport to begin with. Now, all this study, all this focus was good for him, but in order to truly appropriate it, he needed to return to why he started cycling in the first place, to enjoy the freedom of it, the love. And then all the science, all the focus, all the hard work would be able to be of use to him. So it was for me, actually, in seminary. In seminary, we would spend a lot of time trying to study the faith, to be able to use proof texts to support the faith, especially amongst those culture despisers who wanted to dismantle it. And so it came with the Trinity, which you can, of course can seem fairly perplexing, especially to outsiders. So you furrow your brow thinking how you can prove that this is the way it, it had to be. And so as we, in this context, I remember, like it was yesterday, driving in my car, listening to a recorded lecture on ancient church history uh, for a course. I had some recorded lectures at the time. And the professor was talking about how the Trinity developed over the ages. Now, if you understand church history, you realize that our, the way we express the Trinity, the way we actually articulate it, wasn't really clarified until about 300 years after the church started. So here it is in the fourth century. And the Cappadocian fathers were, were three Eastern fathers who built on one another to give us perhaps our most first clear understanding of what the Trinity is. And building on the first two, uh, St. Gregory the Great uh, and St. Basil, we have St. Gregory of Nyssa. And he said something very simple. He said, in the Trinity, there is unity of activity. Unity of activity. One will. Three persons, one will at all times. At this moment, <laughs> driving through Glenside, the light bulb went on. Ah, oh, it's so simple, of course. That's how you can have one God and three persons. We don't see this anywhere else. They're always doing, have complete harmony in what they're doing at all times. There's no exact analogies, analogy for this in, in all of nature. That's how we can explain how a God is, is fully one, but yet three. But if I think about this now, and I pause, didn't I always believe that? I mean, ever since I first embraced my baptism, ever since I first really began reading scripture in my early 20s, wasn't this clear from all of scripture? <laughs> I mean, this was articulated later in the church, but didn't anyone who had scripture understand this at least intuitively? The spirit, for it, because so often throughout scripture, we see the activity of all three persons of the activity in one breath, <laughs> one activity like we heard today in our gospel. The Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. And so it's one will. And so we come full circle to this understanding by articulating this after 300 years of church history and about three years of seminary. What was all in a certain level, we, we lived in the beginning. Now, we have to explain this because when wrong ideas come up in church history, it can cause trouble. As people try to explain things and they get it wrong, that can derail that initial experience that we have from the beginning. So it's important that we do get our explanations, our theology right. But in order to live it, we can be like Phil Gaiman, 
to remember that first love, that first freedom that we first have, and then apply all that we learn to that so that it can be of great use to us. So that's what I want to do today, especially as we look to what we understand of the Trinity through creation, through the fall, yes, the fall, and the cross. And so in this way, let's first look at creation, where Trinity is not named. And certainly, you look at the creation account, and the Trinity does not jump out at you. And, and that certainly, any definition of that is not going to jump out. But don't we experience this intuitively, even if we can't express it? Even Anyone reading this, a Christian who hears, a brand new Christian, hears there is a Trinity, and reads the, 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 the creation account, just for the first time, will experience this. So you have a speaking of the world into existence. And then what do you have? The spirit hovering over the waters. Is this an impersonal force emanating from God? That's not what we see in scripture. It's not an impersonal force, it's a person. And then we have an approving, it is good. Is this voice approving the same as the voice speaking the world into existence? Or is this the voice of the source, the sender of the activity? We don't need to answer this right now. We don't need to explain this. But we do understand certain, from the activity in creation, we do understand something about the nature of God by his, act, his activity in creation, even through creation. <laughs> what do we know of God? <laughs> that he is good. He doesn't just have goodness. He is good. He gives. Because all theists, I'm not talking about necessarily Christian theists, anyone who believes there's a, a God, a creator God, understands what we call the simplicity of God. That's just a theological term, but it simply means that, <laughs> that God doesn't have parts. He's sufficient in himself. He's perfect. Anyone who's a step beyond an agnostic acknowledges this very simple point. And in this, if he is complete, if he is full in himself, then isn't it to simply follow that nothing is lost to God? Nothing is lost to him. But yet God, who is complete, completely self-sufficient in himself, decides to create, to give. That is generosity. It's a pouring out, so to speak, of one to whom nothing is lost. Now, briefly, and I wanted to say this parenthetically, because I don't want to take too much time with this. You know, there are many analogies of the Trinity. And, and we see this throughout history. St. Augustine come up with analogies. He had uh, many famous analogies, or at least several of them. And the analogy that I like to think of God is as a fountain, just, just briefly, and, and we won't park here for long. But if you can imagine this pouring out, that's what I want to, want to relate to you. God is pouring out, even as he gives creation. If you can conceive a father, the father, so to speak, as the fountain who's pouring out. The son who gives us the basin, something that is tactile to, to hold what is being poured out, the spirit being poured out. All analogies break down, so I don't, I don't want to park here too long. But it's all, here's the, here's the thing, it's all giving, all giving. One activity, unity of activity. So, unpacking a little bit more what we heard, this simple idea. In one breath, all three persons working together, the Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. <laughs> and so by this pouring out, nothing is lost to God. So those are words from the Gospel. But now how is this true, though? Let's just ask this question in light of the fall. <laughs> because in the fall, what do we have but a rejection of this giving of God, this rejection of this gift, this rejection of this pouring out. Man was created to continue this activity of the Trinity, this giving to receive and to give. 
but then what does he do with the giver? He rejects the giver by grasping. <laughs> the one thing that, to which the, God says, not yet. The man and the woman grasp after it. <laughs> and this, in a way, you might say, stops up the fountain. Um, rejects that giving, stops the flow. But if God, let's go back to our understanding of the simplicity of God. If he's complete, if nothing is lost to him, can creation be lost to God because of this? How will he reclaim it? How will he redeem it? This sets up, brothers and sisters, the parameters for our return, which is nothing less than experiencing the Trinity anew. Like Phil Gaiman, going back, not to the first love that you and I had as we understood the Trinity, but even going back to the first love of all creation, that love that we had from the start. Which brings us to the cross, unity of activity. And light of the cross, I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the baptism of our Lord briefly for a moment. <laughs> So many of you have heard me talk about the baptism of the Lord in such, in such a way that I just want to express this in such a way as, as a given, uh, that the baptism of the Lord prefigures the cross. Our Lord is, is re receiving baptism to identify himself fully with our humanity. And in so doing, in anticipating the cross, our Lord will live a short life. He's not concerned with, with doing everything, with, with living out a full retirement, making sure that he experiences everything and checks off the bucket list of, of the created world. No, he's willing to let go. His whole life is about giving. It's about mission. And so here we see, again, the activity of the Trinity giving us insight into the, the character of a very God in himself. And so... Why does he do this? Because nothing is lost to God. He is going to reclaim what was lost in the fall. So here in the baptism of our Lord, we have nothing less than a new creation. The spirit comes anew upon the waters. The sun is there in physical form, giving so that we can receive this Trinity. And then what do we have but the voice? This is the one in whom I am well pleased. Echoing the creation, he saw it and it was good. Why? This is unity of activity. The pouring out of God. So that nothing is lost to him by the giving of God. By giving, nothing is lost to him. One will unity of activity, which brings us to how we, like that cyclist Phil Gaiman, get to that first love, that first freedom that at times we, we lose. Now, you may not be like a professional who's taken something that of which you're an amateur and, and, and then lost that connection. You may not be a theologian furring your brow as I did in seminary trying to refute the culture despisers, but we all have occasion to furrow our brows in a fallen world. There are all things that just seem to exceed our grasp. We want to hold on to them. Good things. But at other times, we try to grasp on to those desires, those things that that, that will, we think will fulfill us, like our first parents. And so by, by holding on, however, by holding on, by trying to amass more, that's the opposite of pouring out. <laughs> and what we could call, as I heard this activity described this week, the saboteur of satisfaction. <laughs> by seeking satisfaction, by holding on, we encounter the enemy of our satisfaction. <laughs> because what is this desire that we have to hold on, to grasp? This is a command. This, this is a command that treats you like slaveries. You must have this in order to be satisfied. When we believe that lie, then we become slaves. This is why God says no, not yet to that forbidden fruit, that forbidden fruit that tempts each of us in our own particular way. 
Why? Because behind every no from God is a bigger yes. And God calls you to let go, to not try to amass, but to pour out with him, to participate in the Trinity, to let go. And as you pour out, then he pours into you. Even as the Son poured out and the Spirit poured into him, the Father superintending this all, even likened to a fountain, saying, it is good, and with this activity, I am well pleased. And so here is where we have that freedom, because there's, there's no freedom in being a slave to desire, but when it comes to giving, it's always a yes. Nothing will ever stop you from giving. You can be in a concentration camp and have everything taken away from you, and you are still free to give. Ultimate freedom. Participating in the Trinity. Pouring out as he pours in. This is what we, what we as Christians call love. This giving. This is the character of God that we see in creation. This is the character of God that we see in redemption. This is the character of God that God wants to give to you as you participate in that trinity. And as we all find, as it was in the beginning, by pouring out, nothing is lost to God, and he is yours forever.